All right. Um, so it's uh, quarter past. So um, continuing with our theme of exciting little robots in Python. Um, I think, yeah. We'll get, we'll get kicked off uh, for this session. Um, please welcome Clinton McKinnon. Clinton's an electrical engineer who's currently working at Obelisk Systems to help teachers teach Python and STEM skills in the classroom with the Starlab coding and robotics platform. Clinton will be sharing the story of how Obelisk Systems went from building robot arms and CubeSat to teaching Python to nearly 2,000 students. Please welcome Clinton. I feel like I have to clap, I'm programmed. Um, I'm Clinton, uh, we're a hardware kind of company. We kind of went into education and uh, this is sort of the story of how we got there. And as, as all engineering, good engineering stories, it starts with a resounding failure. Um, we, we began uh, a couple of years ago uh, designing uh, these boards. They're a little space board. Um, we wanted to build CubeSats and get all into that big dreams and robot arms. Um, so the, we, started, um, we started working in space hardware and biotech, so robot arms, um, myoelectric signals, a lot of really cool stuff. Um, we decided to work with another company to distribute a system where kids could run code on the International Space Station. And um, we designed the hardware for this, this space mission. Um, we managed to get the hardware designed and approved for NASA, so all those things were going quite well. Um, and then at the last minute, a bunch of business things happened and we were kind of dropped out of that project. And so that was a little bit disappointing for us, but in the process, it kind of introduced us to a, a new kind of area that we hadn't initially considered, and that's STEM education. Um, we kind of, it was, something we hadn't considered before and came into that and was very exciting kind of seeing kids get excited about the stuff that we really enjoy. And if anyone's spoken to me, you'll know I enjoy engineering. I talk a little bit too much about it. But <laughs> the, um, it's really, really important at the moment um, as automation is kind of taking over the world and all jobs are sort of being lost. Um, we need to kind of create those new jobs. Um, I've got a quote here from Parliamentary Secretary Karen Andrews, kind of highlighting that need to kind of get kids into STEM and excited about it. Um, there's some really good data about how it will increase our GDP by a significant margin, getting just a few more kids in there. Um, sorry, I'll keep going. Um, so. We initially had this look into the kind of the STEM education market and what toys are out there. And after that last speak talk, I feel a little bit bad about this, but um, so Mindstorm's probably one of the biggest ones, um, but it has this limitation that it is designed as a toy. Um, it's a toy that became an education product. Um, and out of the box, it's quite limiting in what you can actually do. Um, the other thing that's quite big in STEM education at the moment is really exciting things like sending things to space and getting the kids really excited about some massive project, but there's not a lot of depth put into the study. So it's just some very small area of science. Um, and the other one, which there are a very a small number of teachers who do this quite well, and that is use Arduino, but Arduino, um, I have a quote from, from our, uh, from one of our electrical engineers. Arduino's awesome, but hardware will cut you. Um, anyone that's played with any form of Arduino or hardware in electronics, it will hurt you. Um, <laughs> it's just part of, the, part of the game. All part of the fun, you get used to it. But <laughs> um, the other kind of big problem that we have with STEM education, um, particularly with the new kind of legislation that's coming in where a lot of teachers are being forced to teach this. Uh, those teachers we found in New South Wales, so we're primarily in New South Wales, but in New South Wales, it's being put onto the technical arts teachers, the, the, the guys that were doing workshop and have been for the last 15 years. These are the people that, you know that relative you have that's like, why would you work with computers? It's a fad, it's gonna phase out and fizzle out and no one will ever use them. Um, so there's those ones. There's also ones who are 
a bit afraid of it. So like they're not they're not willing to give it a go because they're afraid they'll be bad at it. That the kids will be better than them at it and kind of outstrip them. Um, and luckily for kind of the kids, maybe unluckily for some, um, all of the teachers are kind of being kicked. They're being dragged, kicking and screaming into, um, sorry, seg fault, um, <laughs> drag kicking and streaming into STEM education. Um, so we came up with our solution to this, uh, which is the Star Lab, which we have here. Um, if you saw my lightning talk yesterday, I gave a quick overview of how we uh, went from the original version to this one, but it's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> so we, we designed the hardware, and then we teamed up with this group here, the ME program, to help develop uh, STEM learning materials. Um, I'll first talk a little bit about the hardware. So the hardware is designed to give access to as many sensors as we could kind of cram onto this thing. So uh, I kind of need to read them off. It's, there's a thermometer, infrared, ambient light, ultraviolet light, barometer. There's an IMU, so magnometer, gyroscope, and accelerometer and a camera as well, kind of. All of those are programmable um, over a Wi-Fi network, which we've worked to actually work in schools, so can connect to the Wi-Fi networks in pretty much every school we've had without issue. There's been a few that we had issues with, but those issues have helped inform our decision for the next version of the Wi-Fi app, and so we fixed those as well. Um, <laughs> uh, the primary purpose that we designed it for was as a coding and robotics platform. So you can kind of code on it in Python. Um, and it's kind of had this secondary thing that a lot of science teachers have seen and really liked, which is that you can use it as a data logger and um, get that data really quite well. Um, as a result of how we've designed the hardware, that data is useful and timed quite well, which you tend not to be able to do with operating system based stuff. And we also designed it because massive nerds, a bit of hackers, um, it's also designed to be expandable. So there's an expansion port for adding more hardware of your own or of our own. Um, I keep going. So the next thing we did was an online platform. Um, we we teamed up with, uh, so this group, the ME program, they, um, have a pro they have a curriculum called the iSTEM curriculum, which has taken the idea of, of STEM and integrated it into a single subject. So instead of, teaching, instead of teaching kids science and then maths and then technology and then saying, look, you could use these things together, we teach them at the same time. Um, we worked very closely with them to make our program match that. So as you go through and you learn variables, you also learn about the physics of the sensor that you're programming. And that kind of, each one leads into the other. And the maths of how you can map that. Um, so the online platform has an advantage that it does let kids to kind of the flipped classroom thing. They can work at their own pace, the teachers sort of. And um, so at the moment, we have lesson plans for the teachers so they can kind of just follow this through. Uh, for the iSTEM curriculum. Um, the iSTEM curriculum predated sort of the digital technologies one that's coming in. Um, it's a selective program, but it does share a lot of the outcomes of the digital technologies curriculum. So at the moment, we're working to kind of bring that curriculum, that lesson plan across to the digital technologies. There's a few little things like encryption and stuff that we're adding, which made one of our engineers very happy. <laughs> um, so the other thing we're doing is teacher training. Um, we spend a lot of time working on making this thing really easy to program and easy to use. But we still found that it is a little bit intimidating to people that haven't played with tech before. So they're like, this, this is going to be too hard for me, so I'm not going to try. So um, we're developing a teacher program, um, run a few so far. And one teacher was like terrified at the beginning of the session, and by the end, she was like, I want to use this in every class that I'm doing. Like, uh, she was a science teacher, so hadn't done any programming before, but yeah, loved it by the end and was like excited about Python and all those things. So, very cool. Um, the other good thing about these sessions is they help us know what teachers want, and so we can get that feedback and develop 
things that will make it more useful for teachers um, rather than just kind of doing what engineers do and just doing what we think will be cool. <laughs> we have a tendency to do that. Um, so in order, so the hardware will cut you thing. We'll kind of come back to that with, with this slide. Um, we've kind of taken the cuts. I guess that's why I'm wearing long sleeves. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, we, we kind of enjoy the hardware design, the insanity kind of going mad. And so we've designed this to be really easy to program. Um, there's a little API file that you drop in with it, and that's this Starlab library. All the school needs to have installed is Python. And once that's installed, you grab the IP address off the front, which is printed nice and conveniently on the screen. And then just using one of our API commands, you can either grab information from the sensors or turn on LEDs or turn them off or even drive the rover around. Um, this is also done in such a way that multiple people can connect to each Star Lab. So you can have up to 30 students connecting and gathering information and even writing to the peripherals. So writing to the LCD, telling the motors to drive, which will encourage teamwork because if you have 30 kids all telling the rover to go in different directions, it's not going to get anywhere. Um, <laughs> but that, um, that, that ease of access and ease to use kind of in a school environment is really important because a lot of schools have a lot of trouble getting things installed. And so with this platform, we've made it so you don't have to get anything installed. And actually, when we sell this, we, we put in a um, thumb drive with a standalone version of Python. So you don't really even need to have Python installed. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, so the project's going quite well. We're, in, um, we're currently in 50 schools across Australia. Uh, most of those are in the Hunter Valley. Um, that's where the um, ME program is based. They're kind of a, an initiative of RDA Hunter. Um, RDA are a national group. They kind of develop regional areas, work with industry and partners to kind of in, to encourage innovation and growth in rural areas. Um, but we have some quotes from a couple of the teachers. Um, the second one might be a little bit biased because she is the teacher that helped us develop the program. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, and this is a class from um, our Queensland school who they recently got there one of these and were quite excited to be programming it. Um, we have these. Uh, these are actually like they're designed to be a Mars rover, which we're having a competition at the end of the year where all the kids in our program can compete against each other to see who can make the best autonomous vehicle. We'll let you know how that goes. It'll probably be a bit of a nightmare because it's the first time we're running it. And the first time you run anything, it's always fun. Um, so kind of, I think this is my last slide. So I may have well uh, undershot. <laughs> but um, so I'll just kind of introduce our team. So. The goofy one at the end, that's me. Um, my background, this picture behind me, is uh, my background, which was in simulation. So that weird topological graph that looks a bit like a mountain is actually calcium release, calcium levels in heart cells um, that I simulated on graphics cards. A lot of fun and a lot of crying. <laughs> um, this guy here is Luke. He actually designed this rover. Um, about two weeks, if you were at my lightning talk yesterday, you'd have seen my mad rambling story about that. Uh, he did prosthesis and myo like using myoelectric signals to um, control a robotic arm. Um, some very cool control stuff in that. Um, this is Lewis Quill. Uh, he's here with me. I really wanted him to do a lightning talk yesterday because you'll notice this terrifying device behind him. Um, that's his speaker that he designed for his um, honors thesis, which is actually a Tesla coil. Um, I think he only electrocuted himself twice during that project, and one of those was on an MP3 player, just to, uh, he's, we're constantly surprised that he's still with us because he seems to be able to electrocute himself in the most creative and imagined ways, 
possible. He electrocuted himself on a Raspberry Pi the other day, which you wouldn't think would be possible, but <laughs> apparently is. Um, and this is Levi. He's our um, in-house physicist. Uh, he uh, is also a computer engineer. Um, he did swarm robotics, which is quite cool. So big mothership robot and little ones that run around as well. Um, so um, yeah, so I'll give a little demo in a second. Um, we're going to be at the sprints tomorrow, just kind of set up so everyone can come and have a play. Um, but I'll show, I'll show a little bit of code and kind of you guys. Um, so this is, this is currently streaming from the camera. I'm using my phone as an access point at the moment because, because the PyCon one's been a little bit, and I don't have it set up on there, and I was lazy. <laughs> So I think there's been a couple talks on Pygame. So we teach Pygame as well as part of our thing. It's a nice, easy way to get user inputs from the keyboard and whatnot using Python. But uh, this program is just basically a remote control for the rover. Um, I have commented out here some stuff that um, makes it back up. I could probably put that back in. So if I get in its way. This will probably break it. But anyway, um, this command here turns off the motor, and this one sets it in reverse. But I will run this code. Probably shouldn't leave it on the podium to actually run to drive it, but. <sighs> Yeah, that was what I was afraid of. <laughs> they are actually fairly, fairly robust. We were at um, Edutech earlier in the um, we we're at Edutech earlier in the year, and someone walked around the corner and didn't see it and just kicked it. <laughs> it survived. Uh, the only one that we've broken, we drove repeatedly off the desk until it hit a drawer on the way down. Um, then we spent the rest of the day looking for the draw before reviewing the, looking for the wheel, one of the wheels that went missing, before reviewing the footage and um, discovering that it had gone in the draw because we didn't actually notice the draw was open. But if I do this, I can start driving around. So yeah, the platform's kind of, now, I can't use keyboards. I was hitting enter to try and go forwards then. Um, so this is like very simple application of what you can do. The, the limits are, oh yeah, that's because I tried to drive into the chair. That code um, makes it go backwards whenever it runs into anything. But yeah, so the platform is quite easy to get started. It doesn't take very long to write a piece of code to get some things happening. But once, once you've kind of gotten some small thing happening, you can keep going. And because it's just a Python API, and as, as you guys will all know, having being at PyCon, you know the power of Python and all of the libraries. You can bring those in and actually use them to kind of make this thing even better. And because, because of the way that it's programmed over the network, you can leverage the resources on the computer you're using. So you can do some very complicated things, um, very complicated things, quite, quite like using the power of a computer. Or you can also do the other way and put things on the actual Raspberry Pi and use those limited resources. Um, but yeah, I think, I think I've kind of ran out of content. Um, so if anyone's got any questions or comments. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clinton. All right, has anyone got any questions? Ask the robot. <laughs> <laughs> It'll answer better. <laughs> I don't work in education, but I want one. Are these gonna be commercially available or? You can buy one. They okay. are, they do become, um, they're, they're designed for a classroom, so um, they're quite, they're cost effective for a classroom full of people. You can, you can 
you can get away with teaching a classroom for about $1,700. So that will give you an entire classroom of access to the platform and the robot and all of that. But individually, they are, they are quite expensive at the moment. But we are looking to build a much more affordable kind of version of it to, in the future sometime soon. Yeah, cool. great. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to ask. So, does is the code running on your computer or on the device? Uh, this code's running on my computer. Okay. Um, you can run it on the device. There's there's a Raspberry Pi underneath that handles all the networking, um, and that Raspberry Pi can actually also be used to run Python code. Could it could it be upgraded to make it be sort of more autonomous? Yes, definitely. That is actually the purpose. Okay. Um, so the Mars Rover Challenge, which I mentioned before, yeah. um, is the culmination of the learning program that we go through. So the kids go through the platform, they learn Python, they learn the sensors, they learn the physics, and then are given the skills to sort of design that as an autonomous vehicle. So it can make decisions based on the inputs. And there's a lot of sensors on there, so you can make decisions based on a lot of different things. Um, Um, you spoke a little bit before about um, Arduino hardware being quite painful. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that and what, what the problems are. Um, so if you wanted, so with a piece of Arduino, it is quite easy to just start programming and getting like a simple Hello World program. Once you start adding sensors, because the different sensors all have their own libraries of, and ways of communicating, and then there's, there's wires that come loose, or if your wires are too long, you'll start to get problems. Hardware, uh, hardware has some really fun things. So the, the, the more wires you have, we'll actually start getting noise between them and false positives, and there are a lot of yeah, difficulties. And mostly that data sheet thing, though, is probably the biggest one, because different sensors use different libraries, and finding how they work is sometimes difficult um, to actually get working. Um, this one, they're all kind of, because they're all built in and all of that's been handled, it outputs, it outputs all the sensor data in real SI units. So you're not getting some binary number or something like that. You're getting useful real data. Does that make sense? <laughs> I may have gotten sidetracked. <laughs> uh, I, we've got STEM at our school, but haven't seen one of these things there. <laughs> how, how long is it going to take to get them around to all the schools? Um, that depends on uh, how, how long. Um, it takes us about two days to, uh, to get everything together. So. If you, if you want, uh, come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but um, yeah, hopefully soon we're in all the schools. That's the dream. Um, so I guess in the context of how schools get this, it seems like you guys are working, you said, with some programs that have um, like for remote areas and stuff or regional. So I guess my question would be more like, does the school have to purchase this or is it given to them by the state? Or um, because... Um, I guess the more direct part of my question is, are you guys addressing this gap of like non-rich schools also getting access to your technology? Yeah, so we, we, are, we are working quite hard at that, um, which has been interesting for us because there's a lot of paperwork involved in that and being engineers, we're averse. But um, yeah, the program that we work with, they do distribute some to lower SES schools. Um, there's also quite a few grants, and so we're kind of working with schools to sort of provide them with the information they need to, to make those grants and to get our program into their schools. Um, yeah, so we kind of, we try and, the richer schools, we make them buy it. But yeah, we're, we're really trying to kind of get out there and sort of address that problem. Um, does that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> All right, anyone else have questions? Oh, cool. We, we saw some feedback from the teachers. What do the kids think? Um, most of them love it. Um, yeah, one even made us a wallpaper uh, without, they took a picture from the website and paint sh paint, paint, painted, us, painted us up with MS Paint. That was quite exciting. Um, yeah, they, they seem to really enjoy the program. Actually, that Tharango estate, the teacher's been kind of in contact with us a bit. They're our first Queensland school, so there are quite a few problems getting on the Wi-Fi network. But um, they are, yeah, she was saying that they've had kids that haven't shown up to classes previously, and they um, have started showing up just to kind of play with the iSTEM program and 
the Star Lab. I'm really glad you've addressed the problems of both the, the software installation maintenance and the isolation of the students from the real electronics. But does it ever come back to you that they actually want to start interfacing things electrically? Pardon, sorry. Do, um, they, do they ever want to add their own sensors? Um, at the moment, we haven't found, because we've kind of put a lot of sensors in, though we have found teachers that want more sensors. Um, the science teachers, uh, one of them has been pestering us for a while now to put a chemistry data logger in, because she really liked the idea of having this as a data logger in a chemistry class, which I think yeah, we, we started. And also, uh, my background being in, mine and Luke's backgrounds being in biotech, we want to really do a health monitor because that would be very cool. Um, and, and sorry, just one more question. Um, do you make provision for the, the, the teachers adding their own electronics? Um, yeah, so it's early days for kind of teachers adding their own stuff. The, the breakout board hasn't actually been released yet, so we, we haven't really got much of that going on at the moment. Um, but Everything that we've done so far, we have guides for, for building it. So we have the assembly guide for the robot, kind of how to, how to build it. The, the new one's significantly easier than the original. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we, we are kind of providing all of those, those things. There's quite, we're building them up slowly as, um, as kind of we think of them and as we kind of add them. All right, any final questions? No? Cool. Well, thank you very much, Clinton, no for coming along and showing us all about Star Lab. <laughs> and here is indeed your <gasps> thank you. coffee cup. I that forgot about any it. of your colleagues steal it. They yeah. didn't.